Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Charity. And we're pastors of St. City, a church outside of St. Louis. We've been together over 15 years. And we've been through a lot. And are going through a lot. We've failed and succeeded. We've flown and we've fallen. And we've lived a whole lot of life along the way. We've worked together more than 15 years in marriage, in ministry, business, and parenting. And did I mention we have four kids, nine and under? And if we've learned anything, it's that life is not about the arrival. It's about all the life along the way. Well, hello. Hey there. Welcome to episode 12 of Life Along the Way. We are so excited that you joined us this morning. We are going to have an important conversation today. We're going to be talking about discipleship and what discipleship uh, in our current state of culture looks like versus what discipleship should look like based on what scripture says. Mm -hmm. So discipleship is kind of like a very christian ease word. And when I say christian ease, it's kind of like just making light of some of the language that we use in church that a lot of times becomes very ambiguous and we don't even really know what it is. We just say it and repeat it because that's what you do in church. And I feel like discipleship and making disciples has become one of those phrases where it's something that we hear so often we don't even realize what it really is. And um, because of that, it's hard to carry something out if you don't even know what the goal is that you're trying to aim for. So the point of today is just to kind of refocus on what the target of making disciples is, what a disciple is, what discipleship looks like now, and what it looked like whenever Jesus introduced it to us. Yeah, he said, go and make disciples. Right. And so when we look at the phrase of go and make disciples, if I was to say, hey guys, we're going to meet up Thursday morning at 10 a.m. and we're going to go make disciples. You'd probably get a great response from the church being like, yeah, let's do it. And then none of us would know what that so meant. So it would probably be like what happened a few weeks ago at church when I said, hey men, who needs some fellowship? And everybody was like, uh, er, er, and I said, <laughs> you know, who's just really looking forward to some men's fellowship? And then once again, uh, and I said, all right, guys, who wants a men's steak night? And all of a sudden they like woke up from their sleeping slumber. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, steak, meat. Uh? And we ended up having a great turnout at that night because there was meat. You know, I really feel like in discipleship, there needs to be meat. And sometimes in the fluff of teaching people to be more fully devoted followers of Jesus, we lose just the very practical uh, process and steps that take place during discipleship, yeah. which is life on life, teaching and instruction, mentoring and being a mentee or being a person who is receiving mentorship. And so you know, when we speak of a term like discipleship, it's important to know that there is, uh, there are a few different roles in a discipleship process. So there is a discipler and there is a disciplee. And so many of us have never experienced the traditional form of having someone intentionally invest in their life and disciple them in their spiritual journey and process. And so what happens is there is nothing uh, that God cannot do himself in your life. However, Jesus modeled how to disciple other people. Mm -hmm. And what he ended up doing was teaching his followers, teaching the people who followed after him, how to live, how to seek God, how to pray, how to fish, and how to move, and how to stay humble. And so, you know, I, I've asked uh, several of the men uh, who are in our church and who are around, have you ever had someone intentionally disciple you and the overwhelming majority or the overwhelming answer is no and I'm not even quite sure what 
discipleship is. And so that's the really the framework for this conversation that we want to have this morning about discipleship is that there is a lot of need for clarity mm-hmm. about what discipleship is and what it looks like to be discipled. Right. So maybe the best thing we can do is start off with what discipleship is not. Um, A lot of times um, through Bible studies and through um, workbooks or marketing of Western Christian culture, everything that has to do with getting together in a setting that is kind of talking about God is lumped into the I don't know, the terminology or or thought of discipleship of discipleship. And And that discipleship can happen in those settings, but it is a specific thing. And so discipleship is not just getting a cool book with a nice notebook that goes with it and getting together with some friends and kind of talking about it. That's study, that's fellowship, that's being in community. But discipleship is something that is basically um, not even just for Christianity. Discipleship is any type of ideology or theology where there is a person that is mentoring, that is teaching, and that is showing other people how to walk in that same way. It's very similar to even how doctors, they have a fellowship yeah. where they enter in and they are under people that are in a specialty. Or they, residency. 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 Yes, you're right. yeah. Fellowship is a part of that process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's very similar to that, where it's not just some residences, residence doctors, I'm sorry, my words are not coming today, um, getting together and talking about what they already kind of know and hanging out. It's literally um, intentional going behind someone that is already in a field of study, walking behind them, watching them, doing it with them, and then doing it while they watch. You have a really... um interesting way of sharing this. And I I believe you may have heard it from um, uh, your sisterhood group, Um, but it's actually a process of the order of how you teach someone to do something. And so can you like clearly say that in the way that we model how to disciple or how to do something? So discipling, and this is just in general, not even in you know, a Christian context, just anything that you are a disciple of, it is being around someone that is in a specialty or a study or an ideology where you can see how they do it and then gradually step into that. And so what we like to say is that there's kind of a couple different levels. Mm -hmm. It's you watch me do. And so you're with me, you don't help me, but you watch me. And then it's you help me while I do. And then is I help you while you do it. And then I watch you as you do it. And so it goes from you just being an observer to you being a helper to you kind of taking the lead and I assisting you as you need it to you being the only one doing it and me just observing you. And there's just this kind of um, transformation of getting your feet wet and not setting yourself up to fail, but also being able to uh, receive instruction and actually doing it because anyone that's ever learned how to do anything, it's always learned best with hands-on experience. In that, in that model, as far as faith goes, that can be modeled through so many different spiritual disciplines, and it can happen through uh, so many different evangelistic opportunities. So when it comes to praying and teaching someone to pray, the disciples even asked, the disciples of Jesus in Scripture asked Jesus to teach them, <clears throat> excuse me, to pray. And so they asked. And what Jesus did was he modeled and they watched. They listened. And he said, this is how you pray. And they had asked him, teach us how to pray. And so you can do this same thing in prayer. You can do this with how do I spend more time in the Word? How do I um, receive from God's Word? And so whoever is discipling you would show you how they spend time in the word and you observe that. And then they walk you through 
when they spend time in the word, you being a part of that and asking questions as they're doing it and actually reading with you and being an active participant, but being led. And then you can have the opportunity to do that while someone else is assisting you reading. And so there is this modeling process that happens in discipleship. In, in Christianity, the term uh, discipleship primarily refers to, and this is off of Wikipedia, a dedicated follower of Jesus. And this term, this is a disciple, this term is found in the New Testament only in the Gospels and Acts. In the ancient world, a disciple is a follower or an adherent of a teacher. It is not the same thing as being a student in the modern sense. Mm -hmm. It's not the same because a student doesn't always have the opportunity to put into practice what they're being taught as a student, at least in the the educational sense of the term. You don't usually apply what you're being taught in most cases until you, you grow up and you enter the world. And so you are this student where you are receiving knowledge, practicing, receiving knowledge, working out formulas, receiving knowledge. And then maybe as you get your first job, when you're 14, 15, or 16, you begin counting change. You begin yeah. utilizing that information. But discipleship is a hands-on, life-on-life, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, other times one-to-two, one-to-three, and even one to four, or Jesus had multiple disciples, but usually when he was discipling actively, he was either in that instruction phase or he was allowing them to observe. And so we see examples in scripture of Jesus discipling and modeling uh, spiritual disciplines, how to live, bringing correction, uh, directing the disciples, how to make sure that they uh, they operate according to God's spirit and faithfully in the word. And so we see examples of this even taking place uh, on an individual basis. Now, the meaning of, a, of discipleship is this. A disciple has been shown to be someone who follows the teachings, the life and aim of another until the person becomes like the master. Discipleship in the Christian sense is the process of making someone become like Christ. The disciple of Christ is to become like Christ in everything, mm -hmm. in everything. And so when we look at the model of discipleship, first we look towards Jesus, who is the author of discipleship, because ultimately the goal is to be more like Christ, the original discipler. And so you had kind of hit on how there is a difference between a student and a disciple. And we see that several times in the scripture, how there would be many crowds that follow Jesus. But when it came down to those who were actually learning from him and becoming more like him, walking in his footsteps, there was 12 that were close to him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that number got larger You know, whenever he ascended and the Holy Spirit fell. Um, they multiplied. However... In our culture, a lot of times we think that we're being disciples or we're making disciples, but really we're we're kind of just making students and holding class. Mm. And the difference between a student and a disciple is there is an activation of experience that comes with a disciple, and a student is usually, honestly, on the on the level of theology. And I've got in, something that goes right with what you just said. So not to interrupt, but to add to. A Christian disciple is a believer who follows Christ and then offers his own imitation of Christ as a model for others to follow it. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says that a disciple, well, in, in Acts, it says a disciple is first a believer who has exercised faith. It says that in Acts 2.38. And it's a special form of passing on leadership through discipleship that also happens. And it's called apostolic succession. Mm -hmm. And so it talks about how a leader will pass on their spiritual authority and succession onto another leader through a discipleship process. 
Yeah, and you could even see this in the Old Testament, like um, with Elijah the prophet, whenever he passed on his anointing to Elisha, which is what he was asked asking for he said I don't want you to leave like pass on your anointing and he did he actually got a greater anointing but you see that um through the prophets and even Samuel who was brought up and he had an anointing on him so it's not a model that just came whenever Jesus came onto the scene this is a model that God had had kind of embedded into the culture of religion and of who he was. It's just something I feel like was highlighted more when Jesus came because all of a sudden we didn't have to wait to be in the temple, to be in the presence of God. Jesus made that bridge to where all of us could have the Holy Spirit in us and therefore all of us could operate in the way that, that Jesus told him through the power Mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. Um, The problem is I feel like now is that we want to be disciples without the activation of moving from theology to active living. So here's the thing. There's a reason why that word disciple has a common root to the word discipline. What's that reason? Well, you tell me. Is there? Is it possible that there is a disciplining process that takes place when correction is needing to be brought in order to help people become more like Jesus? I'm sure that's part of it, is that to be a disciple, you have to have permission to disciple someone. Otherwise, you're just kind of teaching them and whether or not they learn is um, up to them. And so... We like to say there's like a two, two, two process in discipleship. You want to be following two people and being discipled. You want to be walking alongside of two people and um, have them be like brothers and stuff. And then you want to have two people that you are discipling and pouring into. And just like if somebody's trying to disciple me, if I don't give them the spiritual permission and authority to do that, it's not going to be a discipling relationship. It's going to be um, they're going to talk at me and I might or might not let it sink in like a student in a classroom. They might be required to be there. It doesn't mean that they're going to take that information and put it into their life and put it to heart. Um, And so very much like um, pastoring, you can preach at someone, but you have to have their permission to pastor them. Yeah, that's so good. And it's very similar to discipleship. And I, I feel like in our culture now, there's very much of a God is only love culture that we have in our Western church. And if you look in the scriptures, God was absolutely love, but you sell him short and cut off a piece of who he is by separating his love from his holiness. Mm. And through holiness in a sinful world, to you, you require discipline because you're required to take the things that are not holy out of you to become more like Jesus. I love how you know you use the term that in order to be pastored, you have to give permission of the person who is pastoring you. You know, that's that's a culturally relevant way of saying that someone who's being pastored needs to be humble enough to be in submission to the spirit or the spiritual authority of the person who is guiding and disciplining. Now, pastoring doesn't necessarily mean discipling because there is a direct connection between pastoring and shepherding. Mm-hmm. So our Churches, when you're pastoring, are considered a flock likened to a shepherd who has a flock. But I can tell you, and this is just in the the most loving and funny sense, there's nothing that's more frustrating and more difficult as a pastor or a shepherd than trying to lead the sheep and finding out that the sheep can't be led. As a matter of fact, it might not even be a sheep it's more of a goat. And so what you end up having is you having you have someone that you can't lead like a shepherd would lead a sheep. You have someone who is really not a sheep at all. As, as a matter of fact, they're very difficult to help lead in a loving sense. And they're not submissive like a sheep is to the shepherd. They're more like a stubborn goat who doesn't want to move. And I really believe that there is a humbling sense that takes place when you are in a discipleship relationship that you say, look, I'm in a position to learn. I'm in a position to be led and I'm in a position to receive instruction from the person that I am being discipled by. Now, just because you're being 
pastored or someone speaks from a pulpit does not mean that that's the person who is supposed to be discipling you directly. As a matter of fact, if the only place that you're receiving your discipleship from is when you're sitting in a large group of chairs while someone's speaking from a pulpit or a platform, I would, I would encourage you to uh, embrace this episode a little bit more and grow in your understanding of discipleship because you may be more of a student of someone than you are an actual disciple because discipleship is meant to pass on wisdom and leadership of Christ to every person who seeks to follow him. And we see the model in the Bible and it begins with Jesus, but the whole point is to raise up believers who are dedicated to him. And the result is, is that we step into the calling that God has given. And there is a growth process that takes place. But there are a few specific characteristics and qualities of discipleship, and one of those include going to share the good news to non-believers, beginning to teach other people, to loving God, loving others, standing out, denying ourselves, being firm in God's word, and the fellowship with other believers, but ultimately being imitators of Christ and dedicated and steadfast and investing in missions and outreach. And so I really believe that there are some specific qualities that you grow in as you become a more devoted follower of Jesus and you are being discipled and led the right way. Mm -hmm. So I think that one of the things that um, I've experienced personally as people have discipled me and there's been times where I've received that well and there's been times where I have taken everything as a criticism and either isolated or cut relationship, you know, even if that was just through not seeking out. And so, you know, I've been a Christian for a long time. And so I can see the maturity of submitting to discipleship being a very, very large key factor in my personal growth. Um, but it says in Proverbs twenty thirty, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. And part of discipleship is becoming more holy, becoming more like Jesus because you want to um, follow Jesus. And part of becoming more holy is sifting out in your personal life and in your heart, the things that are keeping us from being holy because Jesus is holy. And so a big part of discipleship is accountability. Mm. It is um, speaking truth in love. And unfortunately right now in our Western culture and, you know, there's a reflection of our culture in the church probably more than it should be is that we have a spirit of offense that is rampant that we don't see people um, discipling through truth as something that they're trying to feed into us. We see any type of correction or accountability as um, discipline, which is not always true. And we also see it as criticism, which mm. is not true. And if you look in the word as Jesus discipled his disciples, the 12 disciples, it was um, pretty evident that he would call them out in love repeatedly on the things that they had wrong. But if he wouldn't have done that, there would have been no growth and there would have been no like leveling up to get closer to God. And so um, I think right now in our culture and unfortunately our church reflects more of the culture than the culture reflects of the church. Yeah. And when that happens, there's going to be key components that are necessary that get left out, that get tainted. And one of those is the accountability process, which is necessary in a discipling relationship. And it says in Proverbs that, you know, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, that the blueness of a wound, it's like a bruise. It's like, yes, sometimes you get wounded, but a bruise means that there is blood that is coming to that that spot and it, it is healing yeah. that wound. And so whenever there is blueness in a wound, that means it's being healed and that it cleanseth away evil. That's what it says in Proverbs twenty thirty, And so it's important for us to realize that if we want to become holy, we're going to have to be open to having those pieces of us that are not holy getting taken out and opening us up to the accountability of someone that's farther along in the process 
that is able to look at us through love, but also maybe see pieces of themselves that they've already removed that they can point out in us to evaluate and not to receive that as a mortal wound, but as a cleansing wound that, you know, it's never fun. You've got to gotta, hear you've gotta about. count the cost of discipleship. Luke 14, verse 25, all the way uh, through verse 35 is nothing but helping us understand the cost of discipleship. So that's a secret nugget. It's really not. If you have your Bible, you can get to it. But Luke 14, verse 25 through 35, specifically talks about the importance of understanding, not just going into discipleship blind, but actually counting the cost of discipleship because there is a difference between being a follower and being a disciple. A follower is one who follows, one who comes after another. And a disciple is a person who learns from another person, especially one who then teaches others. And so, you know, would you ever um, decide to go into a career and be discipled and taught and then just never teach that information to someone else? No, especially if you're looking from a profit stand standpoint. If I'm going to become an accountant or if I'm going to become an attorney, I want to have somebody teach me those ways, but I want them to do that so I am then able to multiply someone else underneath me and have a business and have more profit. It's the same thing spiritually. If you think of um, spiritual investment as far as like profit and a profit is souls one for the kingdom of God, right? But our investment is being submitted to how God has shown us to live. And so it says in the word to go into all the, the world making disciples. It doesn't say making followers, it says making disciples because disciples multiply, followers gather. Mm. And so in, in the instance of scripture, you know, it says in Luke 14, 25, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And he's not saying that, hey, you have to hate your family. He's saying in comparison to the dedication of me, your love for your family will look like hate because you have to love me above everything I else. You need to be first, Jesus Yeah, says. he has yeah. to be first. And it's the same thing in making disciples is you don't, we're not called to make followers. And unfortunately, that's what we've turned the Western church into is making followers, whether that's on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or just butts in the seats once a month to say, hey, I have this many people. But that's not what God called us to do. He wasn't concerned with the crowds. In fact, there was many times that he tried to get people to stop following him because he was trying to get them to either become his disciple or not to follow him at all because there's not a middle ground. Mm -hmm. And so there was time he said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then a whole bunch of people stopped following him. And he didn't say that to gross people out. He, he was saying that to try to show people um, the amount of dedication it, it takes to be a disciple of Jesus, which is you cannot be in halfway. It's either all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And so God was not concerned about followers. He was concerned about disciples. And um, unfortunately, it is in our culture. I know I struggle with having the fear of man over the fear of God and the fear of man says, I want to people please. I want to get people to like me. I want to get people to affirm me. But the fear of God says, my word says to make disciples yeah. and not to make followers. And if they hated me, how much more will they hate you? And so um, it's a little bit of a culture shock when you start reading these things and you realize how far our church, like Big C Church, mm -hmm. and our personal lives have, have gotten from what it really means to make disciples. Well, the truth is that um, when we look at how Jesus modeled discipleship and how he discipled his followers to become disciples, okay, he picked out some specific people mm -hmm. that he decided to disciple. But the truth is, is that real discipleship takes time. Absolutely. Um, real discipleship takes effort. Mm -hmm. 
real discipleship can be dirty and not be pretty. Real discipleship can be painful. And real discipleship is rewarding, though. Mm -hmm. And there is not just a... um, a benefit to you personally, but there's a benefit to others eternally. Mm -hmm. And I really believe, um, that there are some, some specific things that deal with discipleship. And one of those things is spiritual maturity, um, and that you have to be ready, um, to receive. Now, here's the thing. One of the things that Jesus did, he didn't wait for the disciples to be ready to bring, Uh, a deeper level of understanding to help them know that their thinking and that their way of thinking and doing things was not his way. And to be able to say truth in love, Mm -hmm. you're not, you're not thinking like I'm thinking your, your ways are not my ways. You need to understand that there are times where I need to help you beyond your own understanding. And what that requires is a heart that's submissive to my leading and my process. And this is Jesus. And anyone who disciples you, if they're discipling you uh, towards anything else other than Jesus, if there's pruning that's taking place for any reason other than to help you uh, take steps towards Jesus and to benefit so that Jesus can grow, they may not be discipling the proper way. But in discipleship, pruning takes place, and there is, in order for growth to take place, there has to be this pruning. And each one of us need to be able to understand um, that the process of discipleship is a real journey. Yeah. And there's a couple, you know, it's, it's easy to talk theology of what discipleship in theory looks like. But when it comes down to what it actually looks like in our context, you can really look in the scripture and it gives us pretty clear outlines that it shows that Jesus called the disciples. He specifically said, you know, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so there was, um, you can't really sneak somebody into being your disciple. You can't bait and switch them. It's very much like, Hey, I see you follow me. And it's not saying we're Jesus, but Hey, I see you and I want to feed into you and I want to, you know, be with you and I want to help you with your journey. And then there was a response that happened from the disciples. They put down what they were doing and they followed him. So there is a calling and there is a response. What that looks like, you know, in our context is, you know, I have um, people in my life that are farther down the road than me in pastoring with their husbands and planting churches. And there is opportunity to become part of a network or a group or just a friendship. And it wasn't just like, oh yeah, hang out and see what happens. It's like, no, there was intentionality of the calling. And there was also a response from me like, hey, I'm going to make this meeting a priority. I am going to pray. I am going to receive what you say to me. And so there was the calling, but there was also the response. It's the mm-hmm. same same thing that Jesus did that is necessary to establish that relationship. It's not something that you kind of just accidentally fall into. It's like, no, it's intentional. And yeah. it was intentional with Jesus when he called each of his disciples. He saw them. He called them. They responded to him. And then there was... um just consistency mm-hmm. and Jesus, he ate with them. He worked with them. He yeah. I mean, was, he modeled, mm-hmm. um, and, 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 and everything that he discipled revolved around teaching his disciples a lesson and giving them opportunities to step out in faith and to grow and build relationships with them. He rebuked them and he ultimately, his goal was to prepare them to be able to disciple others. Mm-hmm. So there was, there was some directness, that had to happen from time to time. And I, I, I want you to know that if you are going to be discipled, if you are ever going to move beyond being um, a follower or an observer or someone who just sits in a seat and occasionally like helps out, if you are ever going to lead someone else, you need to be uh, in a discipling relationship where you can allow yourself to be, that you have to push yourself to be humble, to be stretched, and to be taught, because that is what you will be doing when you are discipling other people. You know, 
if all that is going on in your discipleship relationship with someone else where you're be, being a discipled by someone is fluff and there's no depth and it's, oh, let's just uh, Proverbs it through our discipleship process and just read a nice little daily uh, nugget of wisdom. I want you to know that while your faith may grow, the process of you becoming a disciple who has the ability the nourishment, the strength, the training, and the modeling of leading someone else into a relationship that can then make more disciples, which is the goal. The ultimate goal of the church is not to just hang out in a circle, but the ultimate goal is to literally be hospitals for the hurting and the sick and to be able to edify, encourage, build them up, and help them become disciples that make disciples. And I believe that our churches, while it's never wrong to create more fully devoted followers of Jesus, we need to understand that we need to be, be, we need to be discipled in a way that we are able to disciple other people. And the church at some point has lost the ability to do life on life. And I believe that we tried to mask this with a small group movement, and we started saying, let's just meet at a house and eat, and we'll sing a little bit together, and we'll read a little bit of Scripture. But there never was a true discipleship process. And so there began to be this great drifting away from what real true, authentic discipleship is because we begin to see or think that being in a small group is discipleship or getting together in Sunday school is discipleship or meeting up on a Tuesday night is and hanging out with other believers or going to a worship night. That's discipleship. And the truth is, while discipleship can take place in every one of those settings, those settings themselves are not discipleship. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the heart of people is to be discipled, to to grow in their faith and begin to uh, and be able to or taught and modeled how to lead other people to Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the presence of other leaders and I very rarely in a moment when we're in public see someone... um, be evangelistic intentionally about their faith. Now, you are evangelistic intentionally in order to help someone become a follower of Jesus and accept Christ so that they can become a disciple and share their testimony and disciple someone else. And so our goal at some point has switched from teaching and leading like Jesus did to then have, having people recite a prayer, which then... Uh, we can cross off or add one more number to our list. Hey, we got someone to say that prayer. So someone's saved. My job is done. And I believe that as leaders, we at some point have lost our fervor for first being a disciple of Jesus. Second, being discipled by someone else who can help us grow in discipleship. And third, a desire to disciple and lead someone else and model it in a way that they then can lead someone else. Now, Jesus, I wouldn't say he created the ultimate multi-level marketing tool because you don't get any reward for creating disciples for yourself. What happens is, is that you create more fully devoted followers and disciples of Jesus. And it's our honor out of obedience to do that. It's our joy to be able to do that, to share and see people grow. And so I want to I, I want to just help you understand that discipleship is not um, this um this process where you just have to go and grab a book and read what discipleship is. And then now that you've read the book on discipleship and you've gone through specific chapters and specific rites of passage, that you become a disciple. That it's actually something that every one of the the followers of Jesus that were his disciples continue to do. And we see in Scripture this apostolic transition into the people they discipled 
and it continued throughout the generations. So is there a difference between salvation and discipleship? Salvation is a, is a one-time event. It happens uh, the moment someone believes in Jesus for eternal life. But discipleship is a long-term process, and it happens when a saved person decides to obey Jesus on a daily basis. I love that. Uh, go ahead. So um, like Scott was explaining discipleship, there's some intentional things that you kind of um, encompass discipleship. The first one, like we had said, is that there is an intentional calling and then there's a response. Then there is intimacy and consistency to where you're consistently around that person. They are part of your life. But there's also intimacy. If you look in the word, um, there is constant expression of maybe things that aren't very flattering among the disciples, whether it's them arguing who's going to sit next to Jesus, or it is um, Peter cutting off somebody's ear, or um, Jesus having to rebuke Peter and say, get behind me, Satan, because he was trying to tell him he wasn't going to have to go to the cross. Um, So that's intimacy, is seeing the bad along with the good. Mm -hmm. It's being open. And so not only is there consistency in discipleship, but there's also intimacy in discipleship. And then also there is um, permission to to have like a parental or authority, spiritual authority, but also submission. If you look in the word, um, Jesus was able to speak to this disciples with authority and um, they were able to submit to what he said, but he was also able to act in authority and they were able to submit to his example whenever they would walk into um, and do miracles as well. And so there is this pattern of, you know, call and response, intimacy and consistency, and also authority and submission. And then it it comes to replication where they then had disciples of their own who they sent out and they replicated what Jesus showed them. It's the same thing in the church, you know. I think one of the things that Jesus models how to be a disciple is that at whatever cost to follow Jesus, at whatever cost to grow closer to him at whatever the cost is to 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 be in his presence more at whatever cost to humble ourselves more to lay down our lives and our struggles and allow him to come in and perform surgery in our life so that we can grow and be closer to him each and every day listen we want to encourage you to be in a relationship with someone who can disciple you biblically. The Gospel of Mark gives seven great examples of discipleship. And I just want you to know that if you're looking for any more resources on discipleship, if you're local and you're looking for help and and um, for us to help point you in the direction of someone who can disciple you, we would love for you to reach out at the St. City Facebook page. Uh, send us a message uh, through our website. There is a portion where you can do that at saintcitychurch.com. But we just want you to know that Jesus loves you. And that if you're not in a discipling relationship or you're not being discipled, or maybe you're fully capable and you are being discipled, but you're not discipling others, there is always a next step in the process and in your faith that you can take. And we hope that you take that today. We want to thank you for joining us on the podcast today of Life Along the Way. We can't wait to continue some of these amazing discussions with stories in the coming weeks about God's spirit and his presence and how he is coming alive in our lives today. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Life Along the Way. We'll see you later. Bye.